Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Hey, I'm talking into a microphone, so that must mean it's time for another episode of the Tom Petty Project podcast. This is actually the fifth episode of season nine. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. This is the weekly podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalog, song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. Um, I posted out the poll on the album's title track last week, and it's the most voted on song that we've had to date on social media, which was kind of cool. The breakdown on Twitter was as follows. 2.8% voted the song between a 1 and a 6. Shame on you, shame on you. Uh, 66.7% rated it between a 7 and a 9, and 306 gave it top marks at 10 out of 10. And I think that so far my ratings have always been pretty much in line with the polls, which makes me happy that my thoughts aren't too far out of step with other fans. I should apologize quickly to uh, at Lisa Kelly Pennington over on Instagram, as I revealed my ranking before she had a chance to listen. And she likes to try to guess how I'm going to score each song, and she keeps a track of sort of how she's doing on each album, which is super cool. Um, and to that end, I'm not going to post the actual score on Insta from now on when I ask people for their ratings. Over on Facebook, the results were really similar. Uh, 30% of people rated the song a 10 out of 10, 70% rating it between a 7 and a 9, and nobody going as low as a 1 to 6. Uh, my pal Pete Nestor from the Honest and Unmerciful podcast did prevaricate a little on his score, commenting, 8, 7 if I think too hard about the bells that rattle under the line, his leather jacket had chains that would jingle. Now, I don't know if Pete has a different version of the record than I do, but there's definitely no bells in that section on my vinyl copy. I did go back and listen to that section, you know, on Spotify to see if I'd missed something completely obvious. And I think what you're hearing is it's that it's the treble notes of an acoustic guitar that come through more prominently. So I'm thinking that's maybe what he's talking about. Um, Pete, always open to a rebuttal. I, I may be wrong on this. I'm, I'm certainly not right on everything. Um, also, as a quick note, Pete and his co-host Brian just did a brilliant episode covering John Cougar Mellencamp's album Scarecrow on their show, The Honest and Unmerciful Record Review Podcast. So I'll drop a link uh, in the episode notes for you to that, and you can go listen to how many burritos they award the Coog's eighth studio album. For some reason, I've never dug into Mellencamp's catalogue, and I really only knew Small Town and Jack and Diane, both of which I love. But after listening to their episode, I'm definitely more interested in digging back into more of his work. Associate show producer Paul Roberts re reacted to my mentioning that last week's episode was a long one, saying, never be embarrassed about length, Kevin. It's the quality that counts. As you say, the video expands the song, so why shouldn't your review? One of Tom's upbeat storytelling best, easily a 10 in my book. Now look, Paul, I know that as a fellow Northern English chap, you'd never stoop to double entendre. But, okay, no, you definitely would. And so would I. Um, so that, that gave me a good chuckle. Thanks, man. Um, Edwin Shoemaker also chimed in on the subject, commenting, ah, good, a long episode, I like that. And another awesome song, of course. I remember watching the video on MTV, loved that too. And Edwin goes on to very kindly say, another excellent episode, Kevin. Great song, of course, but yeah, a nine sounds about right. Love the video as well. However, did you notice Terence Trent Darby doing a little cameo there entering the nightclub? I thought that was an interesting extra detail. Anyway, thanks, and looking forward to the next episode. So first of all, Thanks so much again for the kind words, Edwin. And maybe I don't need to worry so much about keeping the episodes in around that 20-minute mark. If the episodes start to get longer and you're not a fan of that, go shout at Paul and Edwin on Facebook because it's their fault. The legend that is John Scott simply commented, 10, of course. And when John speaks, you should listen. But in this case, I'll listen and I'll still disagree. JP Kaufman agreed with my ranking, saying, I'd give it a 9 too. It was a 10 when the album came out. Love it. But it didn't have the longevity of tracks 1, 2, 4, and 5 on the album for me. I have to be in the mood for it, while I'm always happy to hear the others. So I'll be interested to see what he says for this week's episode, which covers track four, obviously. Uh, and finally, Mary Beth Donnelly commented, Call me a heretic if you wish, but this just isn't my favourite Petty song. I don't know why. I recognise there's some great lines, that it's a great story, but it just doesn't stay in my soul. My unscientific way of evaluating music. The way so many other TP songs do. Maybe I heard it too much. I don't know. So I'd probably give it a seven. And then she says in brackets, but don't worry, I'll be back next week to rave about two gunslingers. And that's, it's sort of basically where this song falls for me as well. It probably actually should, I should have put it in the eight range or I should, I should have rated it an eight maybe. You know, if I think about all Tom's songs that I love more, there's a ton of them. But my rating was also based on the objective brilliance of the songwriting, in, in my opinion. So I'm okay with a nine, but eight or nine, I think is, I think is a pretty good call for this song. This past Friday saw the release of Jake Thistle's highly anticipated new EP, The Half Left Out. So seven tracks, I think he might have gotten away with calling it an album. I don't know. Um, I think I'm going to try writing a review of the album rather than sort of doing it. Maybe I'll do an episode, who knows, but I definitely want to write because I don't, don't write often enough. I should try writing a record review. 
Um, and I still might contact Jake about talking about it or a touch base with him about a few things. Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll do another Christmas episode. Needless to say, it's absolutely fabulous, and I just can't say enough about my admiration for Jake's music and also the way he conducts himself. Again, I'll leave a link in the episode notes for you, so you can go check that out if you haven't done that already. Before I wrap this section, this, this, this intro section, I also wanted to send out some support and love for one of our very own Pettyhead family, Sue Heights Bailey Brown. Sue very sadly lost her son Dustin this past weekend. Uh, Dustin was only 38 years old, and he leaves behind a wife and three beautiful children. And my heart just my heart goes out to Dustin's family, and of course to Sue, who I've been Facebook friends with now for quite a few months after we connected in one of the Tom Petty Facebook groups. She always comes across to me as a wonderful, warm, and funny person, so this week's episode is dedicated to the memory of Dustin Brown. And I hope your road back to the light is a very short one, Sue. Okay, sorry to end this section on a somber note, but I felt it was important for me to offer my condolences on the podcast because, as my favourite author Terry Pratchett once wrote, a man's not dead while his name is still spoken. Today's episode looks at the fourth song from Into the Great Wide Open, The Marvelous Two Gunslingers. Uh, There's a link to the song in the episode notes if you want to listen to it before we dig in. I've had a few people tell me that they like to listen to the song first, then the episode, then go back and listen to the song again to see if they pick up on the same things I do. It's not a bad way to do it, and it gets a few more streams for rock and roll in an increasingly pop-oriented world. conversations with Tom Petty when author Paul Zolo mentions to Tom that he was happy to see two gunslingers included on the anthology through the years album that was released in 2000. Tom emphatically responds, I don't see the point in that record, but we were under contract where we had to deliver. So what we did was to pick our favorites, as many of them as we could get in, because they insisted on having all the hits. But since it was a double CD, we were allowed to pick more songs. So we picked our favorite ones and put them in. And you can definitely see Tom's point. Of the 18 songs that have been included on 1993's 16 times platinum Greatest Hits record, 17 were repeated in the anthology collection. The band managed to get non-single deep cuts such as Two Gunslingers, The Wild One Forever, Straight Into Darkness, and It'll All Work Out on the record. But again, you're sort of just repackaging and rehashing the same songs that people already have. And that repackaging of those same songs endlessly does drive fans crazy. Uh, My co-host on the Ultimate Catalog Clash, Corey Morissette, has bemoaned regularly the fact that Aerosmith, have almost as many Greatest Hits compilations out as they have studio albums. And this is where the Petty Estate, for me, has generally been far ahead of most of their contemporaries. If you look at Playback, Live Anthology, American Treasure, Wildflowers and all the rest, and Live at the Fillmore, they're offering lots and lots of new material, along with some of the tried and tested hits, but they're not repeating the same thing and they're not repackaging the same songs over and over again. When Paul asks Tom about the origins of the song and asks if he remembers writing it, Tom recounts Jim Lenahan, an early member of Mudcrutch, giving him a poster for a movie titled Hostile Guns. This came from a years earlier in-joke described by Tom as follows. He was always telling me about movies, and I would kind of wind him up by giving him a really bad movie. Like I'd say, how about Hostile Guns? Now there's a movie. And it was this terrible western, and I thought the title was so funny. He'd be talking Citizen Kane, and I'd say, Hostile Guns, and it really wound him up. So many years later, he came upon the movie poster for Hostile Guns, and he sent me the poster, and it was on my wall. I'm pretty sure that's what was the germ for that song the poster of the gunslingers. And I looked up Hostile Guns, and it really does look like a run-of-the-mill western with, you know, US Marshals, a duplicitous love interest, and lots of gunfights and similar shenanigans. If you've ever seen it, maybe drop me a note in the comments and tell me how it is. Two Gunslingers starts off with a short four-bar centers around that root and suspended fourth alternating pattern. It's in B major, so you get B and B sus four as those two chords, but weirdly, as far as I can tell, the Heartbreak has never played this live in that key. So I'd love to know the story behind why it was recorded in B, but always played in a completely different key live. The earliest bootleg version I found was from 1995 when it's played in F. When it was played in 2014, it was in A, which, you know, you can expect artists to play a song in a lower key as they get older. But in 95, on the Dogs With Wings tour, Tom, it was in peak vocal condition. I mean, I suppose it could just be that it sounded better than us in the studio at that time. Who knows? It also seems that it was always played in a much more plaintive stripped back arrangement. Just, you know, usually Tom on an acoustic guitar and very minimal other instrumentation. I'd be really interested in hearing what the demo for this song sounded like and wonder if there are any alternate versions out there because the way it's recorded is completely different to the way it was ever performed live. So we get that B, B sus 4 pattern to start with the entire band coming in right on the one again. Like everything in the Jeff Lynne era, this is just stacked up with guitars. There's a palm muted guitar chugging fifths 
There's an acoustic guitar strumming the main progression, and there's an electric guitar just strumming the changes. And I think it's either a digital piano or more likely some sort of synth pad also in there that Ben Montench is playing that is, again, just mirroring those chord changes from the root to the sus4. And I'll end up saying this a fair bit in this song, but again, for something that sounds so simple, there is a hell of a lot going on in this seemingly breezy little three-minute ditty. While the drums are playing that straight backbeat, the bass on this one is a little different to much of the straight quarter or eighth notes that we're used to from these two companion records. Here the bass is playing a really nice doom, 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 doom. It's got that pattern to it. So every time the snare hits on the second and fourth beats, the bass note drops out altogether. So immediately there's a slightly different feeling to this one than the three songs that precede it. It has a different groove. Similarly, that chord change to the suspended fourth comes on the two and, not the three. So it's a really effective way to use two simple chords. The only transition into the first verse is Stan Lynch hitting the crash cymbal as he did on the first and third bars of the intro. The keyboard is dialed back and the electric guitar stops playing those chord changes. In fact, the first bar doesn't have that change at all in the first verse. It's just a straight B for the first four beats. In the second half of the verse, when we move to the minor, we get a little four-note synth lick followed by a big shimmering guitar tone with bags of delay and reverb from Mike Campbell on the first beat of that minor key bar. We also get four bars of that major key alternating progression and only two bars of the minor key. So the verses are actually a 12-bar structure, or 4 plus 2, 4 plus 2, rather than an 8 or an 8 plus 1 or an 8 plus 2 that Tom would often employ. That two-bar minor key drop also features the same root to sus4 combination, but here it's G-sharp minor to G-sharp sus4. So we're keeping that same cadence, even though we're changing the, the chords. And in a song filled with them, there's a great little moment here where we, there's the, an addition of a shaken tambourine playing a 16th note triple on the three and after Tom sings no more. The second half of the first verse is a repeat of that four major two minor progression. And there's a super cool little vocal trick that Tom does that I don't know if I'd noticed before. And it's something that rock singers will do from time to time. When Tom sings about the second gunslinger, on the line, he said, yeah, he doesn't enunciate that as he, but rather a sort of sloppy, and Lee said, yeah, so it's, it's an L rather than an H. And I think it might just be because there's a bigger, technical term here, a bigger glottal stop between the pair and he than there is between and Lee. You can roll the latter together much more seamlessly than the former. Either that or Tom was just having fun with the performance. Or, and here's a harebrain theory, if I ever came up with one, uh, maybe the other gunslinger's name is Lee. Yeah, I know it's not because the lyrics in the liner notes don't say that, but hey, it's fun to speculate. And you know what? If the second gunslinger's name is Lee, I'm going to suggest that we should call the first gunslinger Perrin. Maybe because I really like Worcestershire sauce. And yes, that's how you say it. It's not Worcestershire or even Worcestershire or Worcestershire. It's Worcestershire. There you go. Well, I, you know, at least where I grew up. It's pronounced about 17 different ways, depending on exactly where in the UK you were born. As we head into the chorus, we get what I'm pretty sure is a drum machine or a synth drum fill. And it, I suppose it could be a really deep floor tom that's heavily processed too, but it's hard to tell. Uh, and there are plenty of synths on this record, so I, it would have been quicker to do it that way, and I think that's probably what it is. The first six bars of the chorus are an alternating E, sort of, kind of, not really suspended G-sharp chord. If the chart that I found is correct, it's a G-sharp minor ninth over F-sharp. But who the heck knows? Maybe, you know what I'll do? I'll ask Tommy Edwin about it on Twitter because we were talking about some of the chord changes in last week's song and he was showing me how he plays the chorus to that one. So this chorus also sees that bright electric guitar come back in playing an arpeggio over the chord progression and giving this section just a little different vibe again, even though the drums and bass are doing the same thing they've done throughout the song so far. We also get those tambourine triplets added in to give that little bit of extra percussion. And the chorus structure is again slightly atypical for a Heartbreaker song in that it's sort of broken up into six bars and four bars. So the six bars are the I'm taking control of my life, which is repeated three times. And the four bars are the now, right now, oh yeah, and that hanging bar that takes us back into the verse. It also mirrors the verse progression in that it switches again from that major to minor chord before resolving back to the fifth, heading back into the second verse. It's a lot more nuanced to composition than it seems at first. When that minor key hits, we also get Ben Montench playing that same four-note descending arpeggio over those underlying chord changes on piano. So once again, we get this sense of suspense that is caused by those notes being repeated over different roots. Very, very cool. In the second verse, the only real change is the addition of a little sound effect that sort of, it half mimics the crowd hissing and booing after Tom sings that line. But the chorus just plays out again as the first one did before heading into the bridge. And I just love how brilliantly simple and brilliantly clever this bridge is. It plays a little trick on you where you think the key has changed, but it really hasn't. 
The chorus ends on that F sharp chord, which is the, the natural fifth, and the bridge picks up there. So it feels like, or it could feel like a full key change up to the F sharp for two bars, but the key change actually comes in the middle of the bridge. After landing on that F sharp, we drop to E. So again, in B major, that's the fifth drop into the fourth. But then we step a full tone up again to G sharp, which is a major sixth, and not a chord you'd usually pull out at this point. It then drops back to F sharp before resolving back down to the root B. But I love that change in the middle because it just gives that, it gives that section such an, uh, a different feel to, to the rest of the song, well, as a bridge should do. The bass guitar also in this bridge section is now playing full eighth notes all the way through and not pulling out on the twos and fours. There's some more sound effects and the electric guitar is playing a sort of a, a descending eighth note progression through the first two bars of the bridge before that key change lift when the mellow synth pad takes a second in the spotlight to sort of play a little bit of a lead itself. <laughs> Okay, folks, it's time for some petty trivia. Your question from last week was this. In which country did Into the Great Wide Open not reach the top 10? And I was talking about the album, not the single. I, should have, I probably should have specified that um, because it didn't reach the top 10 anywhere in the single. Um, so was it A, the United Kingdom, B, Germany, C, New Zealand, or D, Canada? Well, the album was released on July 2nd, 1992, that's eight days before my 19th birthday. Um, in the UK, as I think I mentioned in the episode, it was the band's highest charting album, reaching number three on the UK chart. In Canada, the album made it up to number four, and in Germany, the album reached number eight. So the answer was... New Zealand. The album fell just outside the top ten there, peaking at 12. And I do sometimes wonder whether album sales were lower outside the US because the band rarely travelled beyond North America when they toured. Um, I was looking on setlist.fm, and of the 1,307 shows that they have catalogued, only 138, or 10.6% of the shows the band ever played, were outside North America. And I think I've read somewhere that Tom didn't enjoy flying, and you know what, if I ever get to speak to Danny Petty, which I would absolutely love to do, um, that's definitely one thing I want to ask about. So sticking with questions of geography, your question for this week is this. In which of the following states did the Heartbreakers play the most gigs? Is it A? Indiana, B, Ohio, C, Michigan, or D, Georgia? Okay, back to the song. Coming back out of the bridge and into the last verse, we now hear the acoustic guitar playing a really cool double-time strumming pattern. And it kind of reminds me a little bit sonically of uh, the verses in Pinball Wizard, but without Townsend's almost off-the-rails manic energy. And there's all sorts of little extra things being thrown into the mix here. Listen after the line, never heard from no more. There's a swept synth pad note played there that you never hear in the rest of the song. Well, I say that confidently without going back to check. I'm pretty sure I've not heard that before. Um, then there's another great little surprise in the last chorus. Instead of that straight alternating, you know, E to, what, what do we say, G sharp, minor ninth over F sharp, Look, let's just call it the G-sharp minor nine thing and get on with our lives. I just generally don't know what the heck that chord is. But in this last chorus, things get even weirder. That alternation doesn't happen, and instead through the front six bars of the chorus, the root note just keeps climbing, while the rest of those notes alternate. So you get this, it's kind of like an odd dissonance that works, but feels a bit strange and slightly disconcerting, but bloody hell, it's brilliant. To hear it best, listen to the notes that the bass guitar is playing in this chorus versus the previous ones. You'll really hear that steady climb up, that ascending uh, progression. The chorus then resolves in the back four bars back to familiar ground, with Benmont playing that piano arpeggio. We hear a repeat of those back four bars and the now, right, now section twice more before the song fully resolves back down to the intro progression, which ends on the root chord on the last bar of the four. It's such a satisfying way to end the song after all those suspended chords and weird combinations of root notes and harmony notes. Vocally, this is a standout performance on the album for me. And kind of like last week, it's not a ferocious display of range or power, but it's a perfectly executed vocal for this song. Tom sits in that, it's kind of like almost falsetto range. That's actually harder to do than it sounds. Um, his voice is crystal clear. There's none of the Dylan-esque drawl or the sort of angry young punk coming through here. 
Um, he's singing in character, but the character here is detached from the narrative and is merely observing and narrating. So Tom uses a very subtly different vocal to what I've come to think of as his natural singing voice. Uh, there are also a couple little Tomisms, of course. There are. He pronounces assembled. It, it's almost assembled. So it, that's I don't know. That, again, I don't know if that's a Gainesville thing, a Florida thing. Um, it could be, and I'll leave my listeners to clue me in on that one. And I also love the way the emphasis is put on the slinger, so gun slingers, rather than the gun when Tom sings those words. And I was thinking, you know, oh, there could be a specific reason that Tom was stressing slinger over gun. Uh, maybe it's some kind of statement, you know, doing one over the other. But I'm pretty sure that in this case, it's just because melodically and rhythmically, it's the only way you can actually really sing that word in this song. The other production choice in this one that really punches it home for me is the lack of any harmonies. Tom's vocal is doubled in the chorus, but he's singing the same notes on two different takes to just add that little bit of width and fullness to that section. But with no harmony, you really get that sense of being told a story directly, where Into the Great Wide Open is hugely cinematic. This is more narrative in a classical literary sense, I think. And don't think this is an epic tale either, by the way. Into the Great Wide Open is, I think, a, a littler song. Again, to throw back to you know, Ivan Anderson's word, it's, it's, a li- it's not quite a little song, but it's a littler song than Two Gunslingers. Two Gunslingers is almost Homerian in scale. So let me justify that by getting into the lyrics. You can happily sit and listen to this as a literal tale of two men who are sick of fighting, saying, bugger this for a lark, I'm going for a pint. To me, it's much, much grander than that. The fire in this song might have come from a single spark of Tom looking at an old movie poster, but there's an incredible depth here that's crept up on me the more and more I've listened to it. Again, we get sort of three acts. In the first act, we get the gunslingers coming together as adversaries, but wearily questioning their fates. The second act sees the crowd gathering and becoming dissatisfied with not getting their pound of flesh. Then the third act sees the two former enemies leave town, possibly together, leaving a void behind them. And that third verse is what makes this song deeper than it appears superficially, for me at least. But let's start with that first verse. Two gunslingers walked out in the street and one said, I don't want to fight no more. And the other gunslinger thought about it and he said, yeah, what are we fighting for? Now this part is cinematic, even though I basically said the song wasn't. But it's also an unbelievably relatable statement at the same time. In 1914, the world went to war for the very first time in the mechanized age. Boys as young as 16 and 17 were sent to the front to be slaughtered in their millions by machine guns and bombs. In December of that year, something incredible happened, and the human spirit rose above the orders and the disorder. In the week leading up to December 25th, French, German, and British soldiers crossed the trenches to exchange seasonal greetings and talk. In some areas, men from both sides ventured into no man's land on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to mingle and exchange food and souvenirs. There were joint burial ceremonies and prisoner swaps, while several meetings ended in caroling. Soldiers who only weeks before had been mowing each other down in hails of copper and steel played games of football or soccer with one another, creating one of the most memorable images of the 1914 Christmas truce. There's a superb line in a song called All Together Now that always makes me very emotional. The line is, a spirit stronger than war was at work that night. December 1914, cold, clear and bright. Country's borders were right out of sight. I have to tell you listeners reading that line or hearing that line always brings you know that it, my my chest tightens and I'm, I'm almost sort of get a little bit weepy um and it highlights the senseless futility and horror of war tom does the same thing in an entirely different way in that first verse two men look across their differences and decide not to fight anymore they stop they change it's an incredibly powerful piece of very succinct writing the chorus then cements the resolve of these two men i'm taking control of my life And if we look back to the First World War, scared, lonely young men decided to ignore their orders and find their humanity again, even if just for a very brief moment. Verse 2 shifts away from the combatants and to the observers, and I could and will argue that this is a commentary on the nature of voyeuristic sadism. Or sadistic voyeurism, depends which way you want to put that, I suppose. While the crowd that assembled for the gunfight were let down, everyone hissed and booed, and the stranger told his missus, that's the last one of these gunfights you're ever going to drag me to. So people in this scene wanted to see bloody violence, probably bloody murder. In an age where so-called talent shows are frequently focused on humiliating those deemed untalented, 
In an age when two men in a steel ring beating each other unconscious while other people pay huge sums to scream and bay for blood, it's considered mainstream entertainment. In an age where nothing is shocking and everything and anything is for sale, Tom highlights that type of madness by giving us a, an ambiguous reaction from a specific member of the crowd and framing it in the context of a bygone era. The public duels, public executions, and other grisly artifacts of our primate past aren't lost to antiquity. They've just been rebranded and advertised in newer, cleverer ways. Now, the stranger could be telling his missus that he's not coming back to the gunfights because he's sick of the violence, or it could be because this was actually a waste of his time because there was no violence. Either way, it's another great comment on the human condition. So we have verse 1 setting up the human choice to stop fighting, to say enough is enough. Verse 2 then moves the focus to the bystanders before verse 3, again in my interpretation, pulls the camera out to that 50,000 foot view of humanity as a whole. It's the line, and there ain't been a gunfight for a long time, maybe never, but nobody knows for sure. And what this suggests to me is that Tom is talking about old enmity between two groups of people rather than any two actual sort of individual combatants. Why do people from one race, religion, creed, tribe, or culture really actually hate people from another? Most younger generations wouldn't be able to articulate it, especially as the initial grievance becomes further removed by decades or centuries. Nobody knows for sure. Most of us are lucky enough to never have experienced war, and the further it gets from us personally, the more it can seem like a mirage. Modern media makes this more accessible to us, sure, but it's still happening on a 50-inch screen rather than on the other side of the road from us. And to me, this means that old enemies, old demons and monsters are much more part of our cultural identity than they are our immediate reality. And as the gunslingers fade into the distance, which could be time, people forget that there was a fight in the first place. In conversations with Tom Petty, when Tom tells author Paul Zolo that the band were allowed to pick some of their favorites for the anthology, Paul asks, so Two Gunslingers is one of your favorites? Tom responds, oh, definitely. I love that song. I was really proud of that when it got done. And when Paul comments, it's a funny song, but meaningful, Tom responds, yeah, it's a really good anti-war song. And obviously the humor in the song is that line, that's the last one of these gunfights you're ever going to drag me to. And in a more playful way, it does remind me of Brian traipsing after his mother in the life of Brian to attend the stoning. He definitely doesn't want to be there and can't wait to get away, but he feels this sense of, you know, this comic sense of obligation. And look, even if most of what I've said here is probably layering a depth of meaning that Tom might not have consciously been looking for, I believe that depth is there nonetheless. A great wine or a great bourbon only reveals its true character once it ages a while. And songs can be like that too. Okay, Petty Heads, that's it for this week. I've loved this song from the very first time I heard it. It sits on that top shelf of Petty Deep Cuts for me that are easy to overlook, but it has a cool structure with some very interesting chord changes. It has lots of small nooks and crannies that you can find interesting things in, and as I've outlined, I think it has an incredibly powerful, timeless message to it. When Rick Rubin talks about the song Wildflowers in the Somewhere You Feel Free documentary, he says that if you don't analyze it, it's a song where Tom plays acoustic guitar and sings. Rubin then says, when in reality, maybe 50 different events happen over the course of that song, and those little elements that happen, none of them draw attention to themselves, but it's reinforced with these different colors that keep it interesting and compelling, and without knowing it, makes you want to listen to it over and over again. And although Two Gunslingers sounds nothing like Wildflowers, I will make the same argument about this song. It's utterly compelling. It has so many shades and hues of both meaning and musicality that you can listen to this song five times in a row and not get sick of it at all. So this one might surprise a few folks, but I'm going to put two gunslingers at the top table and give this one an unapologetic 10 out of 10. The Tom Petty Project is a proud member of the Deep Dive Podcast Network. Go check us out on Twitter at Deep Dive Podnet, and I'm sure you'll find something there that you like. Uh, you can also check out my other podcast, Seaside Pod Review, a Queen podcast that I do with my best friend, Randy, who does all the music for this podcast, uh, and the ultimate catalog clash that I co-host with the hardest working man in podcasting, Corey Morissette. And I haven't done this yet, but I want to read out the full list of shows for you on the Deep Dive Podcast Network, as again, there are probably other bands covered that you'd really dig. So, here goes. Corey and Scott at Backtracks Aerosmith Revisited. Corey and John at Backtracks Theme Music. Corey and Mark at And The Podcast Will Rock, covering for all things Van Halen. Scott does a Uriah Heap, The Magician's Podcast. Nate and John do the Deep Purple Podcast. The Simple Man does Skinnered Reconsidered, which is a fabulous podcast, I should say. The OG, Terry T-Bone Mathley at T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the other side. Rye at Sabbath Bloody Podcast, obviously covering Black Sabbath. 
Paul, Joe, and David at In the Lap of the Pods again, another Queen podcast, and the one that sort of prompted me to start thinking about doing a second podcast. Um, Andy and Matt at Hawkbinge, uh, which covers the Hawkwind catalog. Eric and Jonathan at Maiden A to Z, covering Iron Maiden. Daniel and Josh at Diary of the Mad Men, the Ultimate Aussie podcast. Ben and Sam at Universally Speaking, the Red Hot Chili Peppers podcast. George and Hattie at the Judas Priestcast. Clay and Rye at North by South podcast, which compares music from America and Canada. Greg and Jonathan at So Far, So Pod, So What, which is a Megadeth podcast. Quinn at And Volume for All, which is one of my favorite podcasts at the moment, covering heavy metal, a subject which I know very little about. Uh, Sav, Nick, Steve, and Mark at The Rock Roulette podcast, um, which where they just sort of cover different albums that, are, that the wheel spins up. Chaz and Greg at Regarding Lulu. Chaz and Shatz at Rush Rash, which I'm going to be guesting on next week. And finally, Chaz and Wolfie at Regarding Roger, which is looking at the redo that Roger Waters did of Dark Side of the Moon. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and YouTube at The Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. Go follow, like, subscribe, and all the things. And again, please leave a review or a rating if you haven't done already. Um, keep talking to me on social media, and I'll read out as many of your comments as make sense in the time that I have. Um, and remember that the Tom Petty Project is not affiliated with the Tom Petty Estate in any way. And when you're looking for Tom's music, please visit official streaming platforms, your Apple Music, your Spotify, your Amazon Primes, all those places. Or again, please go and support your local independent record sellers. Go buy a CD. Go buy a bit of vinyl. Go buy yourself a record player. It's a lot of fun to put a piece of vinyl on. And again, you know, I always say this, Jeff Bezos, or as Richard Herring calls him, Ian Amazon, he doesn't need any of your money, folks, and he's not a great person, so don't give him, don't give him too much of your money. If you're looking for official merchandise, go to TomPetty.com, and if you're looking for merchandise for my show, please go to TomPettyProject.com. Don't forget to check out the Tom Petty Nation and Tom Petty Fans Forever groups on Facebook. There's a lot of cool people there. It's a good hang, and every now and again, people like Dana Petty pop up and uh, drop a comment. Until we meet again next week, Keep listening to and sharing Tom's music. Try to be kind. Try to say I love you to someone at least once a day. Stay safe and healthy, and I'll be back with you next week with the penultimate track from side one of Into the Great Wide Open, The Dark of the Sun. Bye-bye.